Welcome to episode 66 of the Serious About Security podcast for December 6, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined again by Mike Hill and Keith Watson. And I will have the first article this week, and we're going to be talking about Twitter. And uh, Twitter has, uh, this is based off the NSA, I, I believe this has a high, uh, high, high likelihood, likelihood to, correlate. to correlate with the NSA um, uh, disclosures that we've heard about. But Twitter has uh, announced that they will, they have enabled, I guess they have enabled, uh, perfect forward secrecy across their sites to protect uh, user data from future decryption. And anybody who doesn't know what perfect forward secrecy is, basically if you don't have perfect forward secrecy, then the certificates that you use uh, to, uh, to exchange uh, data between an SSL site are also used to derive the key to the, to, for your, um, for your uh, decryption of the uh, of the data encryption and decryption of the data between the two sites so if somebody in the future was able to figure out what the key was they would be able to decrypt your communication channel had they if they recorded it in the future what perfect forward secrecy does is it uses a diffie hellman uh, algorithm um, in this case an elliptical curve algorithm to um, to basically derive the keys instead of relying on the certificates. So if somebody was able to decrypt the certificates or get the certificates or whatever in the future, then they would not be able to, to spy on your communication since the, um, since the session key that's used is not derived from the certificates. Right, and, and it also gives you an option to uh, where the key changes each time you make a new session. Right. And yeah. so, therefore, even if they recorded one session and broke one key, they would have that session, but not any others. Right, right. They would have to break each key individually, so, which increases the work factor required for an attacker. So it, it essentially ensures um, that your communications are, it's the NSA says they're recording everything. So it says if, if they, for whatever reason, if Twitter's key uh, certificate expires and somehow they're, the NSA is able to get a hold of it, they still would not be able to decrypt your communications between Twitter. Correct. So. And, and, and also, <coughs> the operational rules of the NSA say that if, if they're recorded plain text data, then they have to keep it for a period of time and then delete it if it's uh, American citizen stuff. Right. If it is encrypted, they can keep it indefinitely. So if in the future there's some way to, to discover the key, like you said, or if there was a weakness in the algorithm, they could actually go back in time, look at all these high priority uh, encrypted sets of data that they want to break and, and use that to their advantage. Right. So it protects you from the disclosure of the certificate and uh, it kind of future proofs yeah. that, but it doesn't, if, if the- Key disclosure is really yes, the, if the, the big issue. If the algorithm they use to derive the, the session keys from is cracked or otherwise broken, it doesn't protect you against that. Obviously, if the Diffie-Hellman elliptical curve uh, algorithm is is broken by the NSA or whatever, then it wouldn't protect you against that. But but uh, that seems that seems uh, well off in the, in the future when that is getting broke, going to be broken. Hopefully, hopefully. Well, and this is. I mean, I think we can maybe thank Edward Snowden for, for companies choosing to do this with the revelations about the NSA. I, I don't see them move, I didn't see them move towards this so much till those revelations came about. Well, I think uh, you're right, but I think uh, kind of Google kind of set the way because I think their implementation occurred before that. Yes, I, I think with their timeline time wise. Before it was disclosed. Before it was disclosed, <laughs> okay, good point. So, so does this, I, I, have, I, have, I know fairly well what perfect forward secrecy means, but I think this also means that if somebody, was able, if somebody was able to spy on your conversation with the certificates, they still wouldn't be able to yes. read your because communication. The session because, keys are yes. generated independently so, of that. So since it uses Diffie-Hellman, basically each 
party has part of the information they need, and with and with yeah, the, using key exchange, yes, they, key can exchange the key. they can derive mm -hmm. the key. So even if if a, a government, for example, had the private key of Twitter, if they were looking at your communications, they would still not be able to read it. Not unless they had their hands inside the server doing the key exchange. Right. Yes. So, so that, that's I guess that's why it's called perfect forward secrecy because it ensures secrecy even if private key was somehow compromised. Yes. So it not only future proofs it, but it also present proofs it. <laughs> right. And, and it's interesting to note that uh, this, this idea of perfect forward secrecy uh, is typically optional. It's optional in SSL, it's optional in IPsec, um, it's included by default in, in stuff we love like SSH, you know, that that's, does it right off the bat. OTR off the record messaging is also another protocol that uses it and I believe it is um, not optional. And, and those are kind of the big ones. That, that, that I know of. Well, from from what I've read, it does generate some overhead. Oh yeah. So well, the key exchange. Yeah, it I takes believe a about fifteen percent is what the elliptical curve one, yeah, which is significantly less than the than the non elliptical curve version of the uh, of the exchange. Sure. But, but you know, hey, a little yeah delay up a little bit of overhead. Curve, yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to complain. I mean, on big that. sites, that could mean it could quite be. a bit of money. So I mean, Google does it. So. Right. Well, they kind of set the standard right. for a lot of these things. So, so and I guess Google well, does it. Hey, we, yeah. why we should do it? Too. And I think after this announcement, uh, Facebook also did it. So Facebook has it implemented right. as well. So I then think. I'd ask you guys, since you have websites, do you have any with SSL enabled, and do you have Perfect Forward Secrecy turned on? I checked, and yes. Yeah, it's good for you. Yes. Of course, we don't use the elliptical curve one, so we've got more overhead, but well, still. Right. We don't, we don't, nobody's complaining. Yeah, nobody's complaining. All right, well, there you go. So we just yeah, use the standard it's DH. It's not as big a cost for us. That's true. We don't have as many users. Yeah, that's we don't true. have as many users. But I, <laughs> as far as I can tell on all of our sites that are using SSL, we do have perfect forward secrecy enabled. Um, we, so, yeah. Good. So we've talked about a few of the companies that have been kind of revealed with the NSA stuff um, that you know Google, uh, Twitter, Facebook are using this. What about some of the other ones that that were also kind of part of that revelation? Microsoft, Apple, um, I did not Yahoo. Check Apple. Are do we know if anyone else is planning at this time to to move towards that? I haven't seen any announcements about it on the other than the Twitter one. Of course, the question I would have is, is it possible in your browser when you go to an HTTPS site to have it tell you what they're using? Yeah, you, you can do it. At least in Chrome, you can. In Chrome, you can? Or yeah, you just look at the certificate information and click the, uh, in the uh, tab on, on getting, and I can do it on, on my mobile device, too. I just forget how to do it. <laughs> Well, that's a good way to tell if a site has got it enabled or not, right. I guess. And there's probably a, a variety of, of tools that could probably determine that for you, too, that are not browser-based. One thing also, if we're, well, we're talking about SSL, and something I noted I, right in the middle of our last podcast is Google has an interesting, uh, something interesting with their certificates in that their certificates are only valid for four months. In addition to using the perfect forward secrecy, their certificates are only valid for a very short amount of time, which is somewhat unusual. Yeah, usually they're 20 years or 50 <laughs> years. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, usually the big sites, the the big sites ha usually have long certificates, which m probably makes them forget about. <laughs> you know, honestly. I know Microsoft has, has been in the news in the past of forgetting to renew their, uh, renew their certificate. Um, and their domains and, and well, other yeah. things like that. So you never know how all that starts out. If it's stuck in purchasing or something, There's yeah, a lot of paper documents. I, I think there was this uh, one incident where somebody renewed Microsoft's domain for them and then and said, they, "Here yeah. you go." Yeah, <laughs> I, I recall that incident too. That was funny. <laughs> it came available and they took advantage and provided it to them. 
so um, any anything else on, on, on this I mean no. I don't know if Apple does it I, I, I forget how to, how to look well I, I just you know I'd like to say you know I applaud Twitter for the effort they I think they've been cranking up their security stance so I mean this is a this is a really good thing for them to do especially with all the NSA revelations you know this says hey you know because there, I think there's a lot of you know there's a lot of uh, rumors about or you know how how could the NSA look at this encrypted data so I think there's some fear out there that maybe they have some keys or some expired keys that they're able to go back so Twitter doing this and, and Facebook and, and Google's been doing it for what a couple of years now you know it, it basically I think helps the users feel protected so I I hope that the other big players will follow suit mm -hmm. I, I I do as well I think it's uh, I, I think it's kind of kind of a shame I guess maybe a little bit that they had to even do it you know Google has been doing Google started doing it before the, right uh, the whole right these all these revelations yeah, I mean they should they really so should get recognition for that you know the fact that they did it before anything was revealed, you know, with the mindset that something like this could potentially happen one day. <laughs> right. So, and, and, and again, the way, the, in Chrome, uh, you, on the desktop, you would, it would uh, click on the little uh, the lock, I believe, and then there's, there's two tabs, and you would click the other, the information Certificate information uh, or yeah. connection information. I think you, I think to do it, so. you got to look at the connection technical details, and what you're looking for is a, a cipher suite that contains something like ECDHE, which is elliptic curve Diffie Hellman exchange. Apparently, on a Android, you just click the lock, and then it says your your connection to at, to www.apple.com is encrypted with 256-bit encryption. The connection uses TLS 1.2, and then it says it's using the e AES 256 CBC cipher blockchain with right. SHA-1 for message authentication and RSA as the key exchange, which means it's not. It's not using right. So you so you want to look for uh, anything with a cipher suite that says ECDHE, and if you don't know what cipher suites are, that's the combination of algorithms used to protect your sessions. So uh, you may see things that, that say, are we using RSA, RC4, 128 bits, SHA, and that would, those define the algorithms and the key sizes uh, used for that particular Yes, and there are two, thing. there's two options as far as perfect for us here. See, there's uh, ECDHE underscore RSA, which is what most of the sites that um, big sites would use. But there's also, uh, I, let me look it up. There's also, um, so my DHE session. DHE RSA. Yeah, so you want EC DHE, I think, in most cases, but the other one works. Anything with DHE and yeah, Diffie D Hellman Diffie Exchange. Hellman exchange. Yeah. And, and I'm noticing that, at least on my sessions, Facebook and Twitter use the same cipher suite. So they're both using the EC DHE. Apple's site does not. Apple site so does not. Twitter also one. uses ECDHE. Right. From my understanding, there's less overhead with an elliptical curve than there is with a standard D, uh, Diffie Hellman. I think it's less bits. Probably. Oh, with the elliptic curve? Yes. Yeah, Google's yeah, using ECDHE generally. also. And, yep. So, good. All right. All right. I think we covered that one. Yeah. All right. Same here. So Mike. Right. Well, to continue the conversation in a different direction here, uh, Google, uh, Facebook, and Twitter have been in the news this week for other reasons as well. Um, uh, uh, Pony Botnet, reported by Trustwave, um, was discovered to have uh, and, and revealed two million compromised accounts. Um, this botnet works a little differently, though. This is not. Um, an attack necessarily on Google or Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, this botnet actually works as a key logger. Uh, so uh, compromised machines, people visited certain websites, got the, the virus, and what it did is it did a key logging and sent the information back to kind of the, the home computer. Uh, so Trustwave uh, posted a blog entry um, 
few days ago, kind of breaking down those two million accounts and uh, what was captured. And so out of those two million, roughly 1.6 million were website login credentials. So that would be you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, and stuff. Uh, 320,000 were email accounts. Uh, 41,000 were FTP accounts. Uh, 3,000 remote desktop accounts. And uh, another 3,000 secure shell accounts. So remote desktop and secure shell, that's, you know, that's probably getting some really privileged systems there. Um, mm -hmm. So they did an analysis of all of this information and kind of broke down and, and ran some analytics. And um, out of that, you know, they did a thing to see what the top 10 passwords were. And uh, in this case, um, 15,820 of them were one, two, three, four, five, six. So our favorite. Um, actually, <laughs> out of the top 10, several are just all numbers. The other, the only two that are not numbers are password and admin. <laughs> the, all the others are just a combination of numbers, usually sequentially, just different lengths. <laughs> Though there is one that's just all ones. And then there's, I was mentioning this to Preston earlier, there, there's one that is one. 1,224 passwords of one. I don't, it, what concerns me about this more than anything is, I'd like to know what site or system that a password of the number one gets you into <laughs> because that would be problematic. Uh, <laughs> so um, in, in the wake of, of this botnet, uh, you know, uh, Facebook and Twitter have been notifying their users. They, they've been able to, you know, I guess be able to identify who was a part of this and, and letting them know they need to, to change their passwords. And, and the same old rules apply. We've talked about this many times. You know, if you use, you know, if you shouldn't use the same username and password in multiple places, but if you do, and you know you've been a part of this attack, you should go change your passwords everywhere that was used. Um, but what, what I think is really interesting about all of this is, um, because this, unlike the other ones, this was not uh, where one company had their whole database dumped or something. This was not the fault of any of the major providers. This really falls on the, you know, the security of, of a user's computer. And what I find very interesting is that so many weak passwords can still be allowed um, in, in these systems. And um, TrustWave, in their blog posting, which we'll provide a link to, you know, they kind of broke it down. They even did, you know, they did a little metric, you know, based on password length and number of characters in the passwords. And they kind of rated them from excellent to terrible where excellent would be, you know, more than eight characters and a combination of four different character types. So, you know, uppercase, lowercase, uh, symbols, numbers, and numbers. symbols and numbers, yeah. Uh, whereas terrible would be, um, I think terrible was like four or less characters or only something. One type of, only one, one type. Only one, one type. Four or less. And f yeah, so 6% fell into that terrible category. Excellent. Although bad percent. and medium were also pretty sizable. Pretty right? sizable. Three quarters, bad. Three quarters of well, stuff. Me medium was almost you know almost half of it, forty four percent. So most folks kind of fall in between. And uh, the other thing TrustWave did that I really I liked was you know we hear all the time you know passwords we hear about all this. I think you even said Keith today. Oh, an another password leak. You know it's like yeah this comes up a lot. So in terms of numbers, yes, I was in terms only of two million. <laughs> yeah, it's only 2 million. This is relatively small comparatively. But what they did is they said, um, how does this compare to seven years ago to the, uh, to the MySpace account leaks of 2006? And um, back in 2006, the top 10 most common passwords comprised 0.9% of the total count. In this latest you know, dump of, of passwords, it comprised 2.4%. In 2006, 1.9% of passwords were five characters or smaller. In 2013, in this two million sample set, 6.6% were five characters or smaller. Again, I find that baffling. I, well, I find it <laughs> not baffling, but 
probably indicative of the fact that more users are using more sites and can't remember as many passwords, so they're reusing. Well, I, I, too. I, I also think that this is different. I mean, this is this is a key logger on a computer. Well, that's I mean, true too. I mean, you're, they're capturing all sorts of passwords. I mean, true. so if you don't change your Not router just, password, which yeah. add, just default admin. Yeah, that's there true. You there you go. Yeah. There's, admin. That, there's there's probably admin, one admin. of your one of your top passwords right there. That's a good uh, point. The admin is your router password is default. And that or so. one two three four. Or so. one two three four. <laughs> yeah, or one two three four. Or you, you know, you may change it or, or something like that. True. Something else. So they're capturing all passwords, even passwords to sites where maybe you don't even care what well, the password is. You just want it to be easy. So your password's one. And they're also capturing <laughs> wrong passwords too. Yeah, they're also type capturing the wrong, wrong password. Passwords. You mistype it. So right. there's that true. factor too. True. True. Um, and the other thing, you know, like, and, and they pointed this out as well, is in the MySpace in 2006, that was one system, where this, as you just mentioned, Preston, is all types of passwords. So MySpace probably had some minimum password complexity requirements, which is why in their total set, it might have been such a smaller number. Um, and, and now the one statistic I found very encouraging, and, and maybe this is a sign that things maybe are headed in the right direction, is that in 2006, only 17% of those passwords were 10 characters or longer. Whereas in this sample set, there was actually 46%. So that kind of, to me, is an interesting statistic as well because, you know, earlier in the report it says, you know, these are bad, these are terrible, here's these things, but if 46% are 10 characters or longer, that's, that's at least, it's good to know that at least there's a fair number of passwords that are at least long, even if it's all just one character type. You know, we'd prefer it be mixed character types, but, you know, five characters of one type is not going to be as strong as 10 characters of one type. So 10 ones is still maybe going to be a little stronger than five ones, maybe. <laughs> well, I think one other thing that's interesting about this is, you know, if you, when Adobe gets compromised, you know your Adobe password is compromised, you know, you can, you can change it. And, and, but if you, if you used, if you use a different password on every single site and you know your Google password got compromised, you don't know what else got compromised. If you use the same password on every site, you know everything's compromised. <laughs> True. <laughs> not that so, we're encouraging know, people. Not, to not, not, that, not that I'm encouraging everybody to use yes. the same password, but it's it's somewhat odd in that you're kind of in this. Okay, uh, what 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 should I do if you use different passwords everywhere? My, I mean, we we previously said use a password management tool. I use LastPass. I have two-factor authentication, so even if my LastPass password were compromised, you couldn't use it. Right. I mean, it would be advisable to change it, obviously. Sure. Well, yeah. But one of the things I, when I saw this come up on the news, was you know Twitter, uh, Facebook, and uh, Google. You know, they mentioned the top three, and I was like, I have two-factor on all three of those accounts. You and, know, and um, with LastPass, it types. It, it, I, it puts my password in the password fields automatically, so a keylogger would not be able to get it. Now, one also, interesting thing that occurred, so. since you mentioned LastPass, because I use LastPass as well, but I don't have the premium account, so I don't have the option for two-factor. I'm, I'm cheap. I haven't paid for it. Twelve bucks, but but maybe maybe I will <laughs> now. You but should. but but I really like Password Safe as well. I'm sort of in between the two. Okay. Here's the thing for me: Password Safe. I keep um, I keep in a Secure location that I can only get to from a few machines, so it's not just out there on a public site like LastPass. So even if somebody were to capture my password safe password, which I wouldn't want them to do, they don't have access to the safe. Whereas with LastPass, the thing that really bothers me, I should go change my password now, <laughs> is that it is available. And that is the one password I would type in. So if I were susceptible to this botnet, if they captured that password, they've got a lot of they've got a lot of access to all the other accounts. Yeah, that's Even why, I never case, that's why I have two factor authentication that's installed. That's why I'm paying you get two yeah. factor and get your UV key too. I've got a UV key. I just don't have a premium account. And, and by two factor, they support less than your UV They support a lot of different two factor methods as that's well. That's right. I mean, UV key is like one of them. Five. Well, they yeah. have like four or five different two factor methods and backup codes and all. And all. Is it like twelve dollars a year, or is yeah. it lifetime? A year. You gotta it's keep paying. Lattes. Why do I have to pay to be secure? Because the product improves over time. Yeah, the product improves over time. <laughs> so it started out; it had just one OTP option. Now it's got four or five. 
Well, that's great, but you know, there's other products that are free that I think you might even be able to stack them on top. Google Google doesn't charge me to use two factor. I appreciate that it offers me two factor. Sorry, I didn't want to take into a tangent, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I went off the tracks here. I think bit, you get other stuff as well, but it doesn't. It's not. You're not just paying for yes. two factor. You're paying for for the last pass for apps, I think, and and I don't know about mobile devices. They, that's that's still free. I think. That's still free. Okay. Is it? Is it yes. for the iPhone? Yeah. Sorry, I, I know this. I yeah. don't know. Anyways, <laughs> back anyway, back but, on the discussion. But but yeah. Um, so yeah. If you were a part of this, obviously it's a good idea to change your passwords. As we mentioned, not to divulge, but using a password safe is a good thing. But uh, if you can, enable two factor, <laughs> pay for it if you need to. <laughs> and um, and like I said, many of these other sites, if they offer two factor, it, it's it's well worth um, enabling it. Uh, the the big ones that we mentioned that where they were able to grab some of those account credentials, um, many of them offer two factor verification authentication so um, I'm sure there'll be uh, more of these things coming as Keith said this barely met a threshold where maybe we shouldn't even talk about it because 2 million in nowadays is you know it doesn't get the big headlines like 150 million passwords well it's an interesting one because unlike a lot of the other ones we hear about where it's a company that's breached this is individual users that had their computers compromised by a key logger and a lot and quite a few users to get 2 million passwords yeah so so I, I know the article mentioned that, uh, one of the articles mentioned keeping your antivirus software up to date. I'm curious about, you know, since a lot of these things can tend to be zero day, how much that would have helped initially. I, I don't know. And I wonder how many people were running Windows XP. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, the one thing I don't think they were able to break down was like the type of computer. I would have been very interested to, to see that statistic, like what where were these attacks successful? Was it on a mobile device? Was it, you know, on a Windows XP machine? Was it was it on a MacBook? You know, where where did they succeed in installing this bot? So maybe we'll find out more over time, but I kind of doubt it. Yeah, I don't <laughs> so, think we'll find out any sort of that any yeah, of that type of information. But yeah, but from a user's point of view, from a user's perspective, you know, keeping your software up to date. Um, if you're running XP. You need to upgrade to something else. I, I think XP what is May, and then it's just not even. It, it, we don't even talk about. Yeah, it. just yeah. just upgrade. We should you just got to get to. We should talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so run the latest version of software that you can for your machine, and if your machine can't get run, a new machine. if your machine can't run anything other than Windows XP, get a new machine. Get a new machine. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, run an antivirus. Keep the definition files up to date, which is almost a daily thing. <laughs> And uh, make sure that it is scanning. Yep. And use a password safe and don't reuse passwords. And use two factor where you can. Yeah, just do all those 10 things and you're good. And, yeah. and, and, then, <laughs> and then you've got like a, what, a 50, 60% then better 50, chance? 50, 50. 50, 50 <laughs> then you've got a better chance of, of surviving. And use an ad blocker. Don't forget sure, about an ad blocker. Ad blockers. Well, no script. And no screen no or no okay. screen. All right, now we're up to about 15 items. So. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so, that, uh, that's, so that's it, right? That's it. All right. Thanks, Mike Hill and Keith Watson. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day.